it automatically, um, I learned how to do that, um, causes a sense of conflict. In other words, um, my opinion is going to be buffeted by the opinions of others. So as I'm looking at a particular statement, as I'm looking at a particular word, I'm going to get pushback. I'm going to be challenged on it. People from different perspectives are going to uh, have different opinions on it. And I think that's um, not simply helpful, but it really is essential. And that's where the, the greatest learning comes from as you're working with professionals um, with all different backgrounds, uh, from the obvious in law enforcement investigation, some federal, some state, uh, some private, also within business, social sciences. Uh, there are many different backgrounds and they bring those backgrounds to the table looking to gain to the truth. We all follow the same principles and the, the principles lead to a, a very high success rate. It's not always perfect, but um, the goal is always to strive for 100% accuracy. Some of the problems we encounter uh, will look like this. This person is deceptive. However, is the person deceptive about this particular allegation or might there be attendant crimes? And this was a, a lesson I learned years ago where a little girl went missing and the father was deceptive about the little girl going missing. Um, he did not kill her, but he was under the influence and, uh, and passed out and unable to supervise her and she got out on her own and was killed. Um, so there is an example where uh, I concluded deception indicated, but it wasn't accurate where that deception was located or why the deception was, was there. It was evident that he was deceptive, but not about the particular allegation. It's also challenging with uh, journalist editing. That can be very difficult. There are certain questions that just need to be asked when a child goes missing. Do you know where your child is? It may seem difficult for some journalists because they're afraid to lose the interview, um, but the person, uh, for example, who did not do it, who has no involvement or no guilty knowledge of what happened to the child, is glad to have that cleared off. Remember um, many years ago, John Walsh used to say to parents, take the polygraph, take the polygraph immediately. Be cleared so police can move on quickly to find your child. Great advice. Um, every so often, and it is rare, but every so often someone is falsely accused and that can cause quite a delay and, and um, quite a lot of heartache, additional heartache. But it's best not to be overly sensitive because parents who have, have a child missing, their priority is the child missing, not their reputation. Um, that was not the case, for example, in some of the ones that we've covered, including the disappearance of Madeline McCann. Their priority was self and self-preservation. It wasn't um, appealing to a kidnapper, describing and, and owning the language of a kidnapping, nor reaching out for her. So this is a strange case that I think um, you'll appreciate some of the feedback from the team that I'm going to bring forward here and hopefully some can, uh, can join us in. We'll see if I can get them in. Um, key of this was, it was pushback. So the first statement I'm gonna look at, um, pulling up here, begins with, uh, well, sir, I, I was at work so that from what my wife has told me and stuff, you know, uh, her and her mother in summer were planting flowers by her grandma's trailer, which is about, you know, 20 feet from the house there, real close to the house. And uh, they, Summers all of a sudden said, mom, I want to go in the house. So she said, fine. And her brothers were in there watching YouTube. And she walked, watched her walk in the door and went in there. And then when, and then she went in there and her brothers said that she's going to go downstairs and play with her toys. So she went downstairs and then her mom come in and says, where's Summer? Well, she's downstairs playing with her toys and she had to holler for, and there was no answer. So she went downstairs, et cetera, et cetera. 
So the first thing we notice about this is that he wasn't there to make this account. He's giving an account from what someone else told him. That puts it under a classification of unreliable. Uh, we are notoriously unreliable when quoting others. And so for that reason, um, in terms of analyzing, we have to keep in mind that we're looking at an unreliable statement. He is relating information from someone else. The difficulty we run into with that is to attempting to understand what is his perspective on this? There are some questions we can answer. And the most important one would be this. Does he believe his wife's account on what happened? Does he entertain doubt? Does he stand strongly behind her? And the length of his description before you there the length of his description talking to the reporter is something unusual when you're relating the words of someone else. What we do is we begin with the presumption of innocence, not a, as a, an ethical or moral stance, but as a principle of statement analysis. So we're going to always believe what the subject, the speaker, tells us unless he talks us out of that position. And in such, we ask ourselves, what would I say? What would you say if you were at work and got a phone call and your five-year-old girl was missing? What would you say? That's your little girl, that's your biological daughter, and she's missing. How long would you stay on the phone? You probably would ask some questions of your wife, the mother, biological mother, and seek to learn, wait, what do you mean she's missing? And where did she go? Where did you last see her? Okay, hang up with me and call 911 right now. And that sort of thing. It wouldn't take long. So when a reporter says, what happened? I was at work, my wife called me and she said my daughter was missing. That would suffice. The reporter obviously wants more detail. And uh, as we've seen thus far, Don and Candace Wells have been more than willing to talk to anyone and everyone. In fact, a, a post that's reported to be from the family, uh, a blog um, came up recently where they're, they show concern over rumors about them and they're still there and that sort of thing. And most parents are thinking to themselves, who cares what some are going through? What are you doing to find Summer? Where is she? Do you know where she is? They show concern for themselves. So what we're going to do is look at his statement under the context of unreliable because he's reporting what someone else has told him. As we go through that, are we able to gain an opinion on whether or not he has confidence in her words? Does he believe her? Does he embellish? Does he add to? And specifically for this statement here, is there a change within the statement itself due to its length? And the second part of this, and, and neither will be terribly long, is a phone interview, the transcripts um, that he did with Chris from the interview room. They're very important and, and relevant regarding the possibility of sexual abuse. So we're looking for that within language. So we're going to begin here. He starts off with well, which is a pause to think, which is something that we're not terribly expecting. My wife called me. My daughter's missing. We note then that he calls the reporter, sir. That is respectful, which is understandable uh, in this particular case. Um, if a reporter is going to carry the message, uh, not only to Summer, but perhaps to the kidnappers, if that's what's happened to her, we want to maintain a, a respectful distance and be grateful for media getting it out there. What we do with that, 
besides the fact that we're a little concerned about the need to pause to even think about what to say here, is we're going to look at if sir changes at all. If sir changes at all. Now, if you've seen my video on um, the mother, you'll note that um, I had concluded that the mother's language showed that uh, uh, neglect. Neglect is what happened to Summer, one way or another. Now, I don't know, and I concluded on the, on the video with what I had to work with, I don't know whether or not she was involved directly or indirectly, but in the very least, it's indirect. The mothers, and this is how that works, the mothers need to portray herself as someone that is uh, hypervigilant on a day where no vigilance, because it's supposed to be a day like no other, uh, excuse me, a day like every other, where no vigilance is necessary. That portrayal is uh, very common in the language of mothers who have been indicated in child abuse cases, uh, particularly for neglect. And that often has to do with substance abuse. Um, some of you will say, well, substance abuse is obvious in this case. And what I'm looking for, what I'm limiting myself to in that video was her language. Yes, I did see the, the, uh, the work that Chris did in terms of the house, um, the disheveled, the mess, the unsanitary conditions. Um, those are typical signs of neglect. And neglect and substance abuse are close cousins. Remember, neglect is, is probably the easiest of all the elements of child abuse because it requires doing nothing or little effort. Um, what we also look for is in the language of addiction is manipulation. The language of addiction is in two distinct categories. One is the language of addiction itself, an act of addiction. And the other is the language of recovery, which is very different, starkly different. And I think um, no training was necessary for people to conclude um, there are substance abuse issues in this family. And, and that was obvious, but it's also in the language as well. So we're a little bit on alert knowing these things um, with what Don says, the father, for manipulation, for manipulation. It shouldn't be necessary. Um, we presume that he had nothing to do with his daughter's disappearance. He was at work. Um, there may be the, the the trauma of a life that he's had weighed in, um, which leads me to a, another point. If you saw the uh, behavioral panel on, on their work um, and the body language analysis, it was very impressive because they took collectively the father's history into account, history of incarceration, substance abuse, accusations, poverty, or everything else you can imagine um, for what it means to be defeated in life and beat down. Uh, and I think they did an excellent job. So you have a chance to watch that. It's, uh, it's become one of my favorite YouTube channels to tune into. So the first thing he says was I was at work. My wife called me and said my daughter was missing. Not exactly. Well, sir, I, I was at work. The pronoun I is something that we use millions of times. Uh, we're very good at it. We don't need to give any pre-thought to decide what pronoun to use. When someone halts or even worse stutters on the pronoun I, generally speaking, it's an increase in tension or stress. So pushback would say, well, this is a, a stressful situation. His daughter is missing. In particular, having trouble with inserting oneself psychologically into the sentence. So we do notice there is a halt or stutter on the eye there, and you'll see it other, other places, um, it is a, an indication of stress. Stress about being present for the words here, specifically. I was at work. Now, is this his priority or is it necessary? Now, if it's unnecessary language, we're looking at some issues here. But to relate a phone call, you have to tell us the setting of the phone call. So what we're going to do is say this priority of being at work 
excuse me, this uh, opening sentence about being at work is necessary to explain why the news came from his wife. So I hope that makes sense to everyone and you can always send me questions later on that. But right now, and instead of calling this a priority, like an alibi building, we're gonna set it aside because it's con contextually appropriate. And we'll see if that remains or not. I was at work, so from what my wife has told me, so he doesn't say what my wife told me, but from what? And so we wonder if that might be the beginning of casting a little bit of doubt or a little bit of shade upon what his wife says. And it, it could very well be, but at any given time, we're willing to let it pass. So from what she told me, not what she told me, but from what? So I'm going to be gleaning, which may mean he can enter into his own language. And that's what we're looking for. From what my wife has told me and stuff, so now we know there's more information that we'd like to learn about, especially if you're an interviewer, there's more things out there that you want to know. Then he uses the expression, you know, this is something we all use and it, it's not something that's nefarious by itself. You know, is an indication that the subject, the speaker, has an awareness at this point of his audience. And the audience could be for him the reporter and or the camera. It likely is, is both, but so what we do with that habit of speech is we notice what topics cause it to enter and perhaps what topics do not cause it to enter. I'll use it when I'm speaking, if I get a little nervous in front of an audience, or a little bit self-conscious for whatever reason. Um, if it's a diff difficult topic that I'm trying to deliver, something that perhaps goes against principle that, that is unusual, um, I may use it then. And I'm aware of it. And you know, uh, her and her mother and Summer were planting flowers by her grandma's trailer, which is about, you know, 20 feet. So I have you know again, and I'm looking at this as being a possible sensitive point here. I have stuff, which is stuff I don't know, and I don't know how far the house is from the trailer unless he tells me. So I'm concerned about this account and why it's causing him to have this extra words added. 20 feet from the house there, real close to the house. So now I'm concerned, going back to her account, about him being aware of neglect. This is a normal day, it's supposed to be, and she's five. 20 feet is about the size of a living room. It's a short distance. And uh, they, Summers, all of a sudden, said, Mom, I want to go in the house. Now, I don't know if these are his words or these are her words. This is why we set it aside as unreliable. And then from there, we can still look to glean information. But unreliable means we cannot draw a conclusion about whether he's telling the truth or not because he's using someone else's language, allegedly. Now, picture... This is a normal summer day. There's nothing extraordinary about it. A five-year-old saying, I want to go in the house, doesn't sound like something that would warrant the language all of a sudden, as if something unexpected happened. So whether this is coming from him as he's editorializing what she said, or if he's quoting her, something is amiss. Now we talk about uh, in analysis, the normal factor. The normal factor is when there is a portrayal within a statement where someone tries to normalize an event. And this is something that you learn very early on in life. So if I had a group of children and I opened up a book and I started off by saying, once upon a time, 
on a day like every other day, they would lean up and know something special, something unique, something different is about to happen. My need to portray it as a normal knows that I'm here for a story and something's about to happen. It's exciting to them. This is along the same vein. There would be nothing that would be sudden about a five-year-old saying, I want to go in the house. It would not be a memorable event. It would not be an event of hormonal consequence, something that causes your adrenaline to go. So someone is editorializing. Is it him or is it a repetition from what she said? Either way, it's not good, and that's why I have it in red. Said, Mom, I want to go in the house. So she said, fine, and her brothers were in there watching TV, so she wa watched her walk in the door. Now, he either got this from her, or he's bringing it into himself, but if a normal day, a nice summer day, in a property that is marvelously private, with all the acres around them. Would anything need to be sudden and unexpected to say for a five-year-old to say go in the house? And would there be a need for the mother to then do eyes on supervision following her right into the house? What he's doing here is he's confirming for me the analysis of Candace's statement that neglect is part of this case. Summer is missing, neglect is part of this case. This is a signal of him either acknowledging her neglect or repeating it. Went in, in there, and then she went in there. So we have an, an unnecessary emphasis. And her brother said she's going to go downstairs and play with her toys. We don't know when actually that was said. It doesn't seem to fit very well. So she went downstairs, and then mom come in. So looking at a present tense verb, come in. And I, I'd like to know, is that a regional expression? Is that the way he normally speaks? What's his baseline on that? Or is there something more there? And says, present tense, where's Summer? Well, she's downstairs playing with her toys. We don't know who this is ascribed to. If you'd like to interpret it, which I don't, you can say it was the, the boys, the brothers. And there was, uh, within the language of the mother, there was the need to blame, cast blame on anyone but herself, which is also part of the language of addiction, is there's always someone else to blame, whether it is the boys, whether it is Don, whether it is the universe conspiring against me, um, we see that in the language of active addiction, where uh, personal responsibility is far removed. That's why we don't like when someone says, I take responsibility for that. We'd rather you take it than talk about taking it. And she had to be hollered for, and there was no answer. This was interesting. She had to be hollered for, um, oftentimes in neglectful homes, will see children who are immune to loud yelling. They're so used to it, it has little impact upon them, if any. And there was no answer. So she went downstairs and she was nowhere to be found. So here we have the word so, which is the same as like because, since, you know. And it shows a need to explain why she went downstairs. We wouldn't need that explanation but he has the need to explain it. And oftentimes it is a way of preempting the question, so why did she go downstairs? That's not a question we would ask. Uh, she was nowhere to be found. Uh, she went out the basement door. It was unlocked. The door was unlocked. And, but she's never left there and she might be on the other side of the house, and I better tell you why, before you ask me, why she might be on the other side of the house. Because I went out there before and, and called for her 
she does not shed, she'd come out from behind the house. And let me tell you the reason why she would do that before you ask me. So here you can see I'm marking up the text there and I'm using the color blue. This should call your eyes to the three of these very close together. This is a strong signal of deliberately withholding information. So the question for us then is, is Don withholding this information or is he this good, the length of this, this good at repeating what someone told him with all these details? Now, I don't think that Candace told him about himself, what he would do. Because she just has to be outside. She's, she's an outdoor type, type of person. And y'all, and, but she was gone, buddy. She was gone. And sir is now buddy. Remember, he began off with the polite, respectful sir. Now we have the casual buddy. So what we ask is, what changed in his mind, that reporter from sir to buddy? And what we look for, you know, we ask questions of it, but what we look for is to find the answer in here between buddy and sir. What's changed? What, what's happened? What is he explaining? And he's giving a lot of detail that's difficult for us to consider that it all came from Candace. He appears to be going down in progression at least from starting off what she told me to his own editorializing and giving of an opinion but he's still supposed to be in the account. Something has changed. It appears here he's withholding information and Buddy, that, that uh, it could be a friendly term, but it's, it's informal, may be a signal of manipulation by ingratiation. I want this reporter to like me now. Remember, those that uh, are in addiction survive by their wits. They survive by their ability to manipulate others. And uh, this appears to be the case in this family. And we can talk about this another time of a person. There's, there's many other things here that we could go into, but uh, time is not a lot permitting for that. And uh, my wife called me. She's gone. She was gone, buddy. And my wife called me. Anyone notice what's wrong with that? He's telling the truth, but something is wrong with that. When we recall what happens in life and we go from experiential memory, in other words, a memory and the language of something that we personally experience. So if I called you and told you something, you would commit to that by saying, Peter called me and told me, X, Y, Z. You would remember that naturally. Naturally is chronological order. When you go out of chronological order, you get our attention. So he had already told us that he was at work and this is what his wife told him. And now talking to Buddy, he goes back my wife called me. So he went from what his wife said to editorializing, and now we're concerned about scripting. Scripting. Scripting is when someone rehearses what they're going to say with someone else or they can do it alone on their own planning. But uh, in this case, he has connected himself now twice 
with his wife on the phone. So investigators should be very concerned that they are coordinating their stories. Coordinating their stories. And I said, hang up from me and call 911 right now. And I, I, another stutter there, was at work. So now he is pushed me back. And I said here, this is natural, and this is not necessarily his not necessarily his priority because contextually it's correct. Even though I was a little concerned about this stutter on the eye or the halting on the eye, I gave him a pass. Now he's back at work again. So when we have that repetition and the unnecessary relating of his location and we move out of chronological order, I have more concerns. Where else has he been? Would be a natural question to ask. Why the need to repeat? You're at work. Is he building an alibi of, of sorts? You know, it's not terribly difficult to ask difficult questions or what would be seemingly difficult questions for reporters. I wish more were in training in terms of how to conduct an interview and they would learn that people that are uh, not involved generally don't get offended or with much offense being asked if they're involved because their mindset is on finding their child. That's what matters. Everything else becomes a shadow. All I can see is my child's face. What is she going through right now? I don't care what you think of me. Help me find my daughter. Help me find my son. Help me find the missing child. But now he needs to tell us that he was at work again. So did he leave work? Was he at work the entire time? There's all sorts of new questions that he is causing to be asked. I called 911 through all my tools that I could in my truck. That's not what he said. So he's causing us to ask if he had gone anywhere else and this becomes a point of interest and you can you can review it at the interview room he didn't take his truck with him which means you see the emphasis here all to take another vehicle besides a truck that you carry your tools in, takes more effort, more time. Particularly in the morning, you've got to transfer all your tools over. I'm not sure if given the history and what I've seen um, in Chris's interviews, if industry is part of his personality. Generally speaking, we don't like to add more work than we need to. And so there's a reason why he didn't have his truck with his tools in it. And then even from there, he qualified which tools, all that, that he could in the vehicle. Did they not all fit? Is he trying to portray that he was in a hurry? Which I, I think that it leans towards that. And his truck is not there. It's not Candace's car. It's a vehicle, which doesn't show closeness. Um, I, I use the example quite frequently so people can understand not only a change of language, but uh, how we address a vehicle. I drove my car down 95. The car ran out of gas. I left my vehicle on the side of the road and got a ride in. The car became a vehicle when it would no longer go. When I get gas and put gas back into it, it'll turn into a car again. The language changes is that way. It, it indicates that something took place. That there was a change of reality. 
So vehicle, I, I'm concerned about that and the need to, to do that. And uh, from there, uh, Jonesboro, you know, no, I don't know. I come out, I got, I made it out here before anyone. Let me tell you why. Before you ask me, well, why did you make it out there so quickly? So he's portraying that it, there was tools he couldn't take with him. And now he has a need to explain why he made it out so quickly before anybody. Because I was freaking out, you know. No, I don't know. This is a really good example of an unnecessary edit in, in a statement of emotions. Anyone would be freaking out. Anyone would be upset learning that your daughter is missing. That's natural. The need to include it in a statement of which he's gone out of chronological order, in which he's emphasized that he wasn't there, he was at work, is very concerning. And when I got home, I drove to the bottom of the property uh, and, uh, and I realized that all my neighbors and stuff were combing the woods looking for her. And I realized, remember the process of, what realized means uh, a processing of information that takes time. This is actually um, elongating time. I realized right then and there that she was not, she was not there. I knew right then and there she was gone. So you might wonder why the, the, that expression is being used. Um, and that would be for a different study, but it could be an indication of guilty knowledge. It also could be an indication of uh, worse fears being realized, that more information is being needed. So I'm very concerned about his need to editorialize and his need to move from what he told her to what he adds in, and I think it shows either a lack of belief in the statement, whether it comes from her or from himself, or he doubts her account, but something is wrong. It's, it's, it's not a, a clear indication of this is what happened. This is what I know in the statement. Let's see if there's any questions in the chat that I could kind of take. Um, Greg Hortley said, story, story, story. Uh, I agree with that. This, that's what scripted language means. Um, law enforcement will call it storytelling. We sometimes refer to it as narrative building. And there's much more there in terms of, of the statement, but for the sake of time, I wanted to look at the second one. Um, we did cover neglect indicating. Um, please take a look at the prior video. Um, the need to place her outside is constant, um, but the the idea that on a normal day, she all of a sudden said, and then I watched her going 20 feet through the door, um, which reminds you something else, uh, is very concerning about neglect. Did you notice the repetition of door? So we looked at that uh, quite a bit. Um, and this sometimes warrants a little more of explanation. On door, when doors enter a statement, unnecessarily we explore for the possibility of sexual abuse. It's not an interpretation and it's not a reinterpretation. We're asking why the need to bring a door into a statement unnecessarily or repetition of door. Now there's some context where you need to say, I open the door. No one was home. I opened the door or I went in but we still look at it for the possibility. And we're not saying the person didn't open the door or didn't look through a door. We're asking why the need to bring out the word door and especially if it's repeated. And we consider the possibility of sexual abuse, child sexual abuse in play. 
we explore forward. We don't conclude it, but we explore forward. Here's why. Uh, it has been, to my own experience, in, in many, many interviews of locating those who abuse children come from abusive backgrounds. I know data might not support that, and I'm always willing to look at the data, um, especially if it's large scale. But it is my experience, and that comes from um, not just analytical interviewing but, interviewing, but at times the therapeutic interview. But that is different. Um, when Chris interviewed Candace, that was not an analytical interview. It was not an investigative interview. It was a therapeutic interview. An investigative interview or analytical interview is going to ask legally sound, open-ended questions, not interrupt, not finish sentences, none of those things. A therape therapeutic interview is one in which a person is trying to assist the subject to acknowledge, to bring to a conclusion. Now, they both have their places, um, but the places are, themselves are quite different. When Chris interviewed her, um, you saw a lot of assurance, a lot of letting her know that um, he was not cross-examining her, he was not interrogating her. Um, he was encouraging her. And those, those type of interviews have their place as well as the analytical or investigative investigative interview, which itself is different from the interrogation. An investigative or analytical interview can turn into an interrogation. Um, that's where threats and accusations come in. The analytical interview is often long. Um, it can seem incredibly boring because of the legally sound open-ended questions. What happened? What happened next? Tell me what that looks like. They're very useful for court. Um, and they use the subject's own language. The analytical interview seeks to avoid introducing language at all costs, whenever possible. From there, it then turns to evidence. It can use the language that's found in evidence, trying to keep it as plain as possible, using the subject's own words in questions back to the subject. Uh, and then eventually it, it can turn into where the subject is being accused of something. Look at the um, next one up. See this show now. So doors um, doors, I'll talk about for a moment here. And why we explore for sexual abuse is and it makes sense psychologically. Someone that's traumatized as a child in sexual abuse will have a hormonal response. Uh, a response of hormonal consequence. Something has gone wrong. And they may remember certain things, even as trauma causes them to forget other things. And we find that the sound of a door opening can stay with them for the rest of their lives. So it's a concern here, and it, it, as the interview goes on, it becomes more so, And let's see if I can get that screen up. And there it is, got it. Okay. And let me just bring this up a little bit in terms of size. So it's clearly legible for everyone. And this one is, uh, and there's the link for Chris's interview. This one is uh, a phone interview between Chris and John and Candace. And it's revelatory. Now I'd like you to, to think about what I just said about the, um, the doors, for example, as you look through this. Now, I haven't heard this audibly, 
And what we do with statement analysis is we initially ignore um, voice inflection, knowing full well that voice inflection uh, as part of body language analysis, um, examining evidence, all part of a larger case and a larger understanding, voice inflection can change a meaning. Whatever word that may be emphasized can bring meaning into question. But here we, we don't have it, and you'll be able to actually see within the language itself. And it just picks up here. In the language of addiction, we find manipulation, very strong point. We find manipulation, the, the subject wants something, whether it is to be believed or wants something tangible. Um, the next step we often find is the subject will be a victim. The subject will portray himself as a victim. Victim of you, victim of me, a victim of parents, a victim of their children. Um, they're not only willing to cast blame on anyone. Uh, this is like someone that, uh, that is involved in child pornography and might blame their own kid. Well, my son had my phone or something like that. And people are often shocked by that. Um, but in active addiction, people will blame anyone to get the blame away from themselves. And so we saw that, I think, with uh, Candace's statement with her, her sons looking to blame them. Well, they blame others. They often attack others. And in between all this, they become philosophers. And so it... it um, and this is some, from a very sad void, but I think addiction gives a, a false filling of that void to a temporary comfort that just never lasts. Uh, it is as one sheriff in Arizona said, it is that the addict is chasing the first high and never reaches it again. The person in active addiction will lecture others. We look for this. They will tell you, you need to live this way. You need to live that way. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to think this. You need to think that. And they become very ruffled when someone doesn't think that way. Um, Don had talked about the Baptist church and the Seventh-day Adventist church. And... Um, if you look at the police statements about the churches, the police statements were very positive that both of these churches reached out to help in any way they could, including um, being there to, to serve lunches and um, refresh the searchers themselves. So the linguistic disposition of law enforcement towards the churches was very positive. Don... Um, said he was in the Baptist church, but then he went to the Seventh-day Adventist church because it was the true Sabbath, he said. And so for those that don't know, the Baptists will meet on Sunday, the uh, Seventh-day Adventists will meet on Saturday. And for most people would consider that not to be a major point, but Don wanted to lecture on that while his daughter was missing. If your daughter was missing, you may not even know what day it is from the lack of sleep. I'm not sure that's something you'd want to debate anyone over. But that need to lecture others and then eventually the need to attack becomes evident and becomes evident here. So Don said, and I'm not sure where this picks up, they're willing to help me sort of find my daughter now. Now, I'm not sure who he's talking about, whether it's Texas Act Research, volunteers, or law enforcement, but everyone's been searching from the beginning. They probably don't want to help me now. They're going back to think that I did it because of what you did. You lied on me, man. So this... We like to jump and say, there's an embedded admission or an embedded confession, it's not always the case. What we look for is someone who's 
origin of the words is self. Here, he's tying it to what someone did. And he's blaming Chris. You, yeah, yeah, you lied on me, man. And Chris, I think he handled this really well. And I, I don't imagine it would be very easy to, to ruffle his feathers, given his background. What did I lie about? Because I told you the truth and you twisted it all, that's lying. And this is a manipulative response. Okay, tell me what I lied about. He agrees with him, that's disarming, but he seeks accountability. Tell me what I lied about. Don said, it might, your opinion. Chris isn't going there. Chris says, tell me what I lied about. Everything. I told you that like, for one, that yeah, me and my stepsister, stepsister had something going on when we was younger and you put on there that it was me and her daughter, which by the way, sounds like a mistake, not a lie, correct? Anyone know the, the ages of, the, of this accusation? Anyone in the chat? So I believe he's talking about a young child here. And this is insight. This is terrible insight. Good, Adam has it. He was 12. She was five, or so abouts. He used the word we, me and my stepsister had something going on. And you said it was me and her daughter. You got the wrong person, so therefore you lied about everything. You twisted it. So, if you want to know what Summer's life was like, besides what you saw in video, listen to the language. Believe him. His perception of reality was not only that there was unity between him at 12 or so, and her at five. But they had something going on. Often the public is shocked, and right, rightfully so, when they hear the language of a predator or of a molester. And molesters do say things about children, like the, the she was asking for it. She was being provocative. They sexualize a child. This is not age disparity. This is not sophistication disparity. This is a 12 year old and a five year old. He's linking them together in unity. And he's saying they had something going on. That's his language. Then, instead of saying, I didn't molest my five-year-old stepsister or niece or wherever, wherever she was, he attacks. And you put it on there that was me, her daughter. That's a tangent. Before he goes off to change the topic in an accusation, he gives you his Verbalized perception of reality. This uh, reminds me of some, time, uh, some of the language that Michael Jackson used to all his victims. Chris says, no. Don says, are you crazy? 
Chris says, no, I didn't. Chris gives a reliable denial. And you don't want to buy into this taking off um, away from molestation over to who the victim was. Candace said, yeah, you did. I said, it's your stepsister. Okay, if you look at the form of that, that sentence, I, past tense, the information, no qualification, no additional words, nothing. It is very likely to be reliable. Chris is telling the truth. I guess my niece or whatever she's supposed to be to me, the one that says I raped her, is 100% lies. So now I'm moving away from stepsister to rape. And he uses a numeric, which is like an unnecessary attempt to persuade, unless it's necessary, and, and here it's not. He either did or didn't. The one that says, I raped her. So now this is a different female, different victim. The first one was a child. This one, we don't know yet, yet about age. Chris said, Trish never said you raped her. And this would be to him, to Chris. Well, it says on her video, what does that have to do with Chris? If she said it on her video, this is the language of addiction. It becomes meshed everywhere. Everyone is against me. The world is against me. My pet is against me. The universe is against me. God is against me. It becomes the ultimate victim. And from that position, it is very difficult to make any changes in life. And Chris rightfully says, well, that's her video. That's not mine. He acknowledges that. And Chris asks, what does Trisha's statement have to do with me? You put her statement on your show, on your podcast. Because I watched her statement and I wanted people just like you to know the truth. Candace laughs. Don't forget, during this phone call, Summer's missing. Don says, and she's lying. And Candace then accuses him also, and, and obviously with the same type of, of pattern of attack, deceive, manipulate, use tangents. Don says, and you see, that's the thing. You don't know whether she's telling the truth or I'm telling the truth. I know who's telling the truth. So here is a strong statement, except it comes on the heels of Candace's. Candace says, you don't care about the truth. Not that you don't know the truth, but you don't care about it. And she said, well, on its face, that's absurd. And watch what Don does. These two work well together. And you see, that's the thing. You don't know whether she's telling the truth or I'm telling the truth. He allows for the possibility that it's not him, but she that's telling the truth. He doesn't say, I'm telling the truth, but I know who's telling the truth, and I believe him. Chris says, right. He keeps his words to a minimum. This is not therapeutic. This is just to get information from someone that's very angry. Here is the perfect time for him to say, I didn't rape my niece. So if he is not able, if he's not capable or willing to say that, we can't say it for him. We can say that he allows for the possibility that she's telling the truth or it's him, which under the accusation, this ought not be. This is manipulative. Look at me, I'm allowing for the possibility because I'm fair and open-minded. It's manipulative. If you're falsely accused, yeah, she's lying. I didn't rape her. She's a liar. But instead he says, I know who's telling the truth. She knows. She knows who's lying. That's the avoidance of that direct confrontation of truth. Well, then, what about the statement you gave me about? Is it your stepsister? Yeah, my stepsister, and we were young.
um, many of you should be familiar if, if you follow any of these cases that the word we is not something we expect to come into a victim statement uh, after the sexual assault. It, it's um, the example of one of Bill Cosby's accusers. Mr. Cosby was wonderful. Mr. Cosby, this and that. Bill, now we're personal. And then once the sexual assault takes place, he, him, Cosby, the great distancing happens and there's no we. From the perspective of the assailant, there is a psychological connection, a psychological unity and cooperation here. That's his perception. What that can tell you is this guy here, he said they had it going on and now he's looking back decades later. He's telling you what his perception is. When he used uh, religious language, um, it's, it's called immature religious language. I, I don't like uh, judging whether someone has a genuine faith, a new faith in spite of all the, the troubles in life or not. But I can tell you he was using talking points in manipulative ways while his daughter was missing. And now he's telling you, this is his perception after all these decades. So the question is, does he pose a risk to children? And if this is all I had to go on, I would say yes. So Chris asked him, kind of a natural question. I, and Chris may have known the answer, I don't know. How old were you? How old were you? It's a really simple question. You know what? She initiated all this. I'm going to tell you that right now. She initiated it, yes. So what has he done? Number one, he has avoided the question. So now the question is itself sensitive to him, his age. Don't forget that we that he used. Putting him into unity with the victim. Now he's blaming someone else. So he avoids the question, doesn't want to answer it, and he's blaming the victim for initiating it. Now, is he blaming the five-year-old or is he blaming his niece, you know, a five-year-old septus or niece? I don't know at this point, but he's blaming the victim. He's not denying it to place but he's blaming by saying who started it, who initiated it. And I'm gonna tell you that right now, she initiated it, yes. So initiated is repeated twice. I'm gonna tell you and yes, means emphasis of four times. And you went along with it? Yeah, I was a kid brother. Now what would that suggest to you? I was a kid brother. I was younger. And how old were you? Chris knew. Chris knew the avoidance of the question is an old salt. I was a kid. I didn't know no better. But you knew enough to tell us that she initiated it? The five-year-old? How old was she? I was still a kid. He doesn't want to give her age. I guess I was a little bit older than her. How much? I can't remember, the number one use of lying in court is I can't remember. I was a kid. How many years difference, remember? Great question. There was a little bit of difference there, you know. No, we don't know. How many? I love that Chris did not give in there. He did not yield. But still, in spite of her age, she initiated it and then stabbed me in the back. So I think this is about the, um, get a little clearer here. This is about the niece or whatever she is to him in his language. How many years? Man, there ain't no talking to you. 
I can see that. You're going to twist everything I say. So there's the attack and there's the manipulation. But really, this is, in a sense, this is a, what we call a Hina clause that he's explaining why he can't talk to, you, to Chris. Chris is asking you uh, very plain questions using a limited amount of words. There's nothing to be twisted there. This is Don today while summer is missing. I'm asking you how many years difference, that's it. I don't know. You're just gonna twist it. You're gonna make me look like, this happened like 40, over 40, I was laughing, uh, years ago, and she wants to bring it up now. It's Candace laughing. I don't know if she said hell or something there. All the time I was in prison, she could have called the cops on me and have me charged for rape if it actually happened. So he, again, is allowing for it as a possibility. Now we know from his words it did happen. From his words, we don't need um, the victim's words here. So you know, it's got to be lies right there. So here's the reason it's got to be lies. She could have called the cops and she didn't. He's a manipulator. He's twisting information. He's doing what he actually accuses Chris of doing. You made me look like a freaking criminal, dude. Sometimes that is associated with prison. I'm trying to change. And there's an admission there. You're accused of rape. You use the word freaking criminal. And you're trying to change from what? Candace says you're an effing idiot. Don said, we all make mistakes. Now, that's unnecessary information. And what he's saying is, I do not want to be alone with the accusation. That's why we're using the word we. This is no different than the, the little kid who comes home who did it, but says, Mom, everyone was doing it. If that gets the, the little boy off the hook, that's a really bad lesson for life. This is like the crowdsourcing of guilt. It tries to minimize or water down the guilt by blaming everyone. We all make mistakes, okay? That's an unnecessary statement. He's talking about child molestation, rape. You act like you're Mr. Perfect. He goes on the attack, like you ain't done effing thing wrong in your life, and that's a lie. Chris says, okay, what have I done wrong? Because remember, he was accused of lying, and that wasn't true. And he was able to very gently and with few words show to Don, that's not true. According to you, not a damn thing, but I'm sure you have. And what he's talking about is something to do with child molestation because this is the context. It's like an accusation. Um, this is what he's showing us here. Instead of it being so shocking, child molestation, to Don, it's normal. And therefore, everyone must be doing it. Um, the case of Haley Dunn, uh, right now Sean Atkins is charged, and I believe that Billie Jean Dunn will be charged as well. But some of you may remember um, one of Billie Jean's defense of having uh, all sorts of vile child porn and uh, homemade porn, bestiality on um, all the her devices, his devices, the kid's um, video game player was who hasn't had bestiality on their phone or on their computer? And so, you know, a, a thousand hands go up and say, I didn't. They normalize it from their point of view and then they project it outward. And that's what he's doing here. And he's angry. He's angry. The language has changed. Chris said, I'm asking you if you know my life, so tell me what I've done. I know what Christ says. He said, everyone has sinned. And Chris said, I'm a sinner. So tell me you haven't sinned. Tell me an effing lie. Chris said, I'm a sinner. I agree with you, which is sometimes what um, can really burn him here as he's on the ropes. Yeah, 
you're a sinner. Don't you effing lie to me. You ain't no better than me. So F you. I will do everything I can to slander your name. Now, what did Chris do? If you think about it, Chris actually highlighted the case here for There we go. He was doing Don a favor. If your child or my child had been missing, we would want someone like Chris, uh, Nancy Grace, uh, back other times, uh, others in media highlighting the plight of our missing child. Instead, he's on the attack. He's on the attack. So in conclusion, and I'll just see if there's a few, any questions I can answer there. In conclusion, neglect is part of this case. Which may indicate an, an untended death or inviting in of, of and drug sales. When you invite drug sales into your home, you're inviting danger. You're putting your children in jeopardy or something more nefarious in this case. Don did not reliably report what Candace told him. In fact, I think there was they argued on the phone. That's from a different statement, though. And in looking at this statements, Summer very likely, in my opinion, based on the language, Summer very likely lived in jeopardy. In other words, ongoing risk of sexual abuse by Don. The language he uses tells us that it's normal for him. So whether it is from the video or whether from the language, Summer had a tragic life. Don spoke very quickly of her in the past tense, indicating a belief that she was dead or knowledge, I don't know. I'll still need more about this, but I, I trust the investigators are doing a good job with it. And these are public statements. These are not private statements. These are public statements we're looking at. Um, Summer Wells did not have a good life. Any questions that I can take? Um, Deb is asking, did sexual abuse contribute to her going missing? I don't know. Um, it may contribute to the... Uh, coordinating of both statements, mother and father. They have something on each other. Um, it's definitely part of the life. Um, Child Protective Services, I believe, were in and out of that house. Um, I know people often look for someone to blame. Um, they can only gather the evidence they can gather and present it to a judge. They are obligated, and this is a good thing, um, they are obligated to work out different types of services to try to mitigate the risk. Um, some parents become very adept at avoiding being interviewed and avoiding having their kids interviewed. And some will do the bare minimum of services and present well, pass a drug test, go out and celebrate with drugs. Um, it is very difficult, very draining, and uh, just like the professionals within law enforcement, the professionals in child protective services lose sleep also over what the plight of some of these children, what it's like for them. I don't, I don't know from the language. I know there's a couple of things that, are, that they've used that are very concerning, whether they have guilty knowledge of where she is. Um, I always, have a tendency to lean towards water in terms of hiding a, a remains, but I don't know, or being buried. I think the dogs would pick it up. There's a lot of things about the case that are puzzling in the sense that the number of dogs that Chris encountered, 
Uh, if there was a stranger on the property, would, would not the dogs alert on that? They work in a pack. The vehicle issue, um, these interviews, I mean, they're, they're just horrendous. Are they lying to protect drug, drug use? Are they lying about Summer? They're definitely lying. She's definitely lying about uh, watching her neglect. And he has me very concerned about sexual abuse of Summer. I also wondered, and this, this to answer another question, I think she's lying about why she cut the child's hair, why she shaved the child's head. Um, a couple of possibilities, I don't, and I don't know, but a couple of possibilities. Some mothers will be so afraid of their daughters being sexually abused that they deliberately try to make them look ugly. And whatever their perception of beauty and ugly is, they try to make them look ugly as protection. Some mothers will try to make them look ugly because they're in competition with their daughters. So I don't know what that's about, but I don't believe that they're telling the truth about the, the shaved head. Yeah, um, great point about the, the aggressive dogs when Chris approached. I mean, it's just natural. Dogs are, are, they feed off each other. Human nature, um, I study it. And I still don't know it, the, the depth of depravity and, and things that go wrong. The one um, we looked at that would be considered an embedded admission or embedded confession wasn't because it was assigned to another reason. So it wasn't coming from his own language, but it was close. Well, thank you, everyone. I apologize for some of the uh, technical difficulties I've had. This was the first time I've used this, and I'm used to going on these things with someone else. Um, but I hope to do more of these type of broadcasts and bring on some other analysts and some experts in different areas as soon as I learn how to use the <laughs> equipment. So thank you all and take care.